Hi everybody and welcome to our next Conversation Aviation podcast from uh, IASA and today uh, we're going to talk all about language proficiency and just language in general. I'm joined by, by Paul Stevens. Um, Paul maybe you could start just a little bit, bit of introduction about yourself, your background and why this topic so passionate for you. Yeah sure John, hi good, good to meet you. Um, yeah so I've I'm the CEO of the Mayflower College, which is a, a language school in, in Plymouth in, in the UK. And I started that uh, 1988, so a long time ago. Wow. And we specialize in, uh, well, we, we now specialize in aviation English. We started in the early 1990s, so quite a long time we've been involved working with pilots and controllers. Uh, and we also do some testing and, and, and training and so on. But my latest um, project, which I've been working on for a couple of years now, is to try and raise awareness about how communication is a shared responsibility in aviation. And that I believe that native English speakers could and should do more to, to help safe, efficient radio telephony. I really love that the way you pitch that and it's something you know, we've exchanged quite a lot of messages and things and, and conversations on LinkedIn particularly around this topic and I think I think that's one of the most interesting things I thought you know, it would be good to have a chat you with with you about on the podcast because so many people view language proficiency as you know, just it's like it's a one-way thing you teach somebody a, a, to speak aviation English and then you hope they do a good enough job of it rather than you know it not just being about the individual person about the people both the two people engaged in a conversation and then all of the people around them and that whether you're a native speaker or a non-native speaker you've all got a part to play in in all of that. I think that's exactly the case um, you know at uh, you don't want to generalize, but there are some native English speakers who think, well, it's not my problem. You know, if, 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 if you don't understand me, I'm a native English speaker. If you don't understand me, that's your problem, not mine. And it, I think it's the answer is it's a shared problem. Um, so as, as we know, you know, ICAO introduced the language proficiency requirements back in 2008, uh, ICAO level four, as it's known. And a lot of countries and, and, and a lot of people spent or have spent and continue to spend a great deal of time and efforts and money trying to raise the level of English of their, their aviation personnel, which is great. And, you know, that process needs to continue. Um, and it's not perfect. You know, the testing is not perfect and, and the training and so on. That, you know, but it's, it's, it's a step in the right direction. But I think where people have... ICAO actually talks about this in the ICAO 9835. I'm just looking on my screen now, quoting, the burden for improved communication should not be seen as falling solely on non-native speakers. Native speakers of English also have a fundamentally important role to play. So ICAO have acknowledged this, that, it, that it's, you know, native speakers have a role to play. But I think in reality, um, thus far, it's the non-native speakers who've had to jump through all the hoops to mm. train and get tested and all the rest of it. And in the majority of cases, native English speaking pilots and controllers have just signed off as level six. Level six being the highest level, never to be tested again. And I, th I think, I'm not sure that's that's totally the way, the best way to do it. Um, I'm always surprised when I read the statistic that, uh, you know, ICAO did a study of 28,000 incidents and accident reports and found that 70% of incidents and accidents involve communication, primarily transfer of verbal information. Now, that seems to me 70% is really, really high. And, you know, it gets, you know, makes me think, surely we can do better than that. And, and I think one of the, 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 the tricks we're missing, if you like, is that it's a relatively easy fix to help native speakers become better communicators. You know, I believe fundamentally that you know, they're, they're not bad communicators because they're being difficult or they're, they're, 
sometimes not the most effective communicators because they don't understand what's going on. They don't understand how challenging it can be to to have to work in a, especially in a field like aviation, um, in another language. Uh, and I think once you, in our experience, you know, w- with some appropriate training, the light bulb moment of, oh, yeah, I never really thought about that. Yeah, you know, why is it so important to stick to standard phraseology? Why is it so important to speak slowly? Why is it so important to, to speak clearly? Why is it so important to chunk your information so it's short messages? All these different things, I think it needs to be handled sensitively because people don't like to be told what to do. But I think if you can explain this is what you're currently doing is problematic, hopefully people will buy into that. Yeah, and that was something that we were talking about before we before we did the usual have a great chat before we press record thing that we always do on these podcasts. But yeah, I was saying, that's the thing when I, I was saying when I first joined DIASA and yeah, having come from the UK and particularly having been in the UK military where using the fanciest word possible is always the best answer to then coming and working at DIASA with an international environment to find myself now in the situation where my first boss when I got here kind of highlighted pretty quickly that all of these fancy words that I was using wasn't really helping anybody because most rooms I was in 90% of people had no idea what I'd said even just by throwing in one word or two words that they had no idea what I was talking about that was it people were losing the whole thing and actually yeah and and it's yeah as you said it's kind of a difficult difficult conversation for a native speaker to say I appreciate that you're a native speaker but Um, And actually moving, kind of stretching the analogies, Um, a book I recently read um, about business communication and the way businesses approach speaking to each other. It's as much a book about culture. It's from a guy called Neil Malarkey. He was a comedian, um, an improv comedian in uh, Mike Myers is the same improv troupe as Mike Myers. And he talks about this idea of... um, in the same way an intro improvisation uses this concept of yes and and you get what you're given you can't change it you just have to keep moving it forward it's the same kind of thing a little bit like this is you start with english you know improving the english of the non-native speakers but then if the goal is we all communicate as effectively as possible to maximize situational awareness then it's all of the steps that take us on that journey almost does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, as I, as I said before... I stretched the analogies a bit there. No, 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 but it's it's a good one. And, and, and I think it's an important one to think about that um, simplicity is really hard to do. You know, it's it, in some quarters, it's considered dumbing down, coming mm. down to the lowest common denominator. And I don't see it that way at all. I think... You know, language is beautiful and we can use it to communicate ideas and emotions and facts and and make people laugh and make people cry and and all the rest of it. And you and I were probably, you know, having been educated in the UK, um, taught to to be fancy with our language, to use idiomatic language, to, to, to play with words, to use similes and metaphors and all that good stuff and and perhaps even to try and impress people with with your wonderful vocabulary well you know there's a place for that but if we're talking about communication and aviation specifically radio telephony i think it has no place at all in in radio telephony it's a, it's a weird form of communication it's not like real life communication or you know you and i sat over a coffee or a beer it's it's purely about getting information from a to b and making sure that both parties understand it in the way that it was intended to be understood so there's this um simplicity is is the key i think but how you do it is 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 a challenge it's it's simplicity is challenging um, but I think once people understand and then hopefully learn the techniques, um, then it can be done fairly easily. Um, and a bit like your analogy with, with the improv, I think you need to, to pick up the signals from the other person. 
And that's more challenging with, with radio telephony. You and I now, we're looking at each other, albeit not in the same room, but on a camera. You know, we can pick up if, if I pull a face or you pull a face. You know, no, I didn't understand. We can pick up on those signals of body language. Of course, in, in the world of radio telephony, that doesn't exist. So all you've got to work with are kind of pauses and, you know, he paused a bit longer than I thought he would pause or she would pause there. Did she understand? Did he? So it's difficult to pick up on the, the signals more than it is in a face to face environment. But that doesn't mean it can't be improved. And I think particularly with uh, when it comes to the con I particularly enjoy a lot of the context we talk about it a lot even in in a lot of our safety promotion is being clear of the purpose of what you're trying to do and I think when you have conversations in English all day it's sometimes difficult to make that mental switch to this conversation isn't you know a social conversation or you know in a business or work environment between two native speakers to do a a particular job this is an aviation conversation and i guess that's also a harder switch to make if you're a native speaker perhaps because it's the you know you're always using english and all of the time and you have to mentally change the purpose your mind on what the purpose of that conversation is i, I think that's exactly right um being aware of why you're communicating mm. you know you, you and i now are having a doing a podcast and there's a whole different set of objectives to the ones that would occur in the world of radio telephony, for example. Um, so uh, I think the, uh, the other point that often is overlooked is that, you know, English is the lingua franca of the world, not just for aviation, but for shipping and internet and science and all sorts of things. And that's that's wonderful for you and me because you know that happens to be the language we were born with, and we we haven't really had to do much work to to be able to learn English. Um, but it's it's not such great news for the rest of the world, and I think it's always important to remember that something like two billion people in the world speak English, but seventy five percent of them are non native speakers. Hmm. You know, we the native speakers are very much in the minority. And whether you like it or not, the reality is, is that English is changing. And now, you know, English is spoken with a Spanish accent or an Italian rhythm or a job. It's changing all the time. And I think um, the attitude of some native speakers within the world of aviation that, you know, you want to fly to my airport, you better speak my language. Or, you know... Uh, if you don't understand me, it's not my problem. I'm a native English speaker. It's your problem. And I, I don't think that's a healthy attitude to have. And I think that's where it comes back to purpose. I'd like to, you know, uh, hopefully if people could, who, who maybe had a view like that could stand back and think, well, if the purpose is to help everybody here from wherever they come in the world, all know what's going on and do what they need to do and go where they need to go as safely as possible that kind of reframes the, the situation a little bit, I guess. And, I, I, I think yeah. so. I think, you know, I like to think that within the world of aviation, you know, more or less everyone buys into the safety element and is aware of safety and realizes there's just a joint effort and it's, uh, we're only as strong as the weakest link and all that stuff. Um, but I think it's difficult to have empathy with a non-native English speaker, if if you yourself are monolingual, hmm. um, speaking a foreign language is great and wonderful, and you know opens all these doors and the rest of it. But it's also, or it can be, terrifying, and it can make you feel very foolish. And it can. I've been in situations um, speaking of in meetings, speaking foreign languages, and. All I want to do is get out of the meeting without making a complete fool of myself. It, it shuts me down. I don't. I no longer want to be an active contributor. I just want to get out of there. And in aviation, you know, there are plenty of examples. They call it communication apprehension, where the non-native speaker just remains quiet. Just be quiet. You know, why, why am I going to get into this 
the situation where potentially I'm going to get flack uh, or, uh, you know, a negative attitude potentially from a native English speaker. And I think this, this, so what we're talking about here is not just about communication and language and, and getting the message from A to B. There's also the human factors side of it. You know, we, we talk a lot in aviation about uh, you know, our safety voice and speaking out. And, and you know, I think we recognize that um, gender can play a role in that, certainly cultural, you know, certain Asian countries. It's, it's less acceptable to, to uh, disagree with a superior and uh, so rank and, and so on. But I think one of the points that we perhaps miss is that to, to speak out requires a certain amount of confidence in yourself and in what you know. And nobody wants to be labelled, oh, Paul, he's a troublemaker. He's always mm. complaining about this or questioning this or whatever. So it requires a certain amount of confidence to speak out in the first place. Now, I would say you layer on top of that... I'm, my English isn't very good, or it's 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 okay, but it's you know it's not fluent, and perhaps you have a negative attitude towards me and, and intimidate me a little bit and and are impatient with me. Am I going to speak out if I think there's a problem? Am I going to say, "Sorry, John, I don't understand." Can you say that again? Probably not. I'm going to shut up and just think the problem goes away. And that potentially, I think, is is, is, is a huge is a huge factor, and, and has been recognised as a factor in, in in catastrophic accidents, where people just remain quiet. It's it, it's funny what you're saying there about. Um, well, actually, maybe it comes both in terms of uh, phraseology and second languages. So, uh, I lived in Germany now twelve years. I remember, you know, I spoke I spoke a little bit of German that I'd done at school before I came, and then practiced a bit before we moved. But I remember the first one of the first, probably most frightening things I had to do fairly early on was to get myself a haircut, um, and I knew all the words. Um, but what I didn't know was obviously in the UK, we have a number one and a number two and a number three and a number four. And I, <laughs> I, I pleasantly asked the German barber for an, for a number two, which is that what yeah. I'd always had. What I wasn't aware is in Germany, they measured it in millimeters. So one <laughs> millimeter, two millimeters. So my number two got me a two millimeter buzz cut. And literally the first time I got a haircut, I literally from there down, I had virtually no hair and I went home and I learned a very valuable lesson. I, you know, I maybe should have Googled a little bit more, but it was an interesting example of, you know, the terror of, and even now my German's really, really good, but there's an element of kind of still terror about that. You know, even when I go for a haircut, in fact, my surprise, I've recently, uh, found a barber i spoke to him in german and he picked up i had a slight accent and now i have a barber from wolverhampton which is quite <laughs> funny and it started because we both realized we had really really bad german accents when we spoke which was kind of funny but yeah, yeah it's that yeah. challenge of how you yeah the language and the terminology together can make for you know that was just a simple mistake and i ended up with a bit of a mess on my mess a bit yeah. shorter hair than i expected you know, but no, it can no, be no, completely no. different no lives were lost, but you know, yeah, it's, completely. in aviation, it, it's potentially a, a different scenario. And uh, you know, back back in the day, I think a lot of people, perhaps native speakers, think, well, why can't everybody learn English? You know, why why, why isn't everybody level six? And I think they're missing the point. It's, you know, yes, in an ideal world, everybody would be level six. But the reality is there are many, many countries out there who have no opportunity to get their people to level six mm. financially, in terms of their educational system, in terms of their train. It's just, you know, what it, some people argue that level four, ICAO level four was too low. Um well, perhaps for Scandinavia or, or even Germany or, or some other countries, yeah, they could they could have managed with level five and still got all their controllers and all their pilots up to level five. But there are certain parts of the world where level four is a huge challenge mm. and continues to be a huge challenge. Um, so in, in that, 
you know, that doesn't mean you stop and you, you, you give up. No, you continue to try and push towards uh, to have the, the non-native speakers improve their English, and certainly their aviation English. But I, I think we're missing a trick in that native speakers with a little bit of training and with a little bit of support and a little bit of awareness um, could learn to contribute much more than they currently do. I think that's a great way to put it, and it's a yeah, it's a great example of you know, a continue this continuous thing I was talking about, the improv comedy thing about the more you know we've got this goal that as many people as possible can communicate as effectively as possible, and it's how we move that forward as in the way we can whilst enabling the industry to function like you say if you know if you set too high a bar and it brings the whole thing to a halt because you, you know an, an, an airline can't train enough pilots in their country or there can't be enough controllers that doesn't help anyone and you know it's how can you be you know help people be as effective at communicating the important things and knowing what everybody's saying and what that means in an aviation context as a starting point and then yeah, I, I, technology I, I, helps, I guess, as well moving forward. Well, yeah, um, technology is is an interesting one. I think, you know, moving forward, even 20, 30 years, I think we're going to be having a very different discussion about communication and aviation. Um, I certainly hope we are, you know, because we're not very good at it. You know, human to human com mm. communication, you know, and the, the 70 percent figure that I quoted earlier, 70% of accidents involve communication is, is proof of that. You know, we, uh, especially when we're communicating in, in, in another language. So hopefully technology will improve that considerably. I think it, it has to, it has to be the future of what we're looking at. Uh, you know, I know we, we've got data link and, and, and a few other things that are but it still seems to me fairly archaic that in today's world where human to human communication over a, a VHF radio with all the, the static and all, all the all the other factors and we're speaking foreign languages, it's got to get better than that, you know. It's and technology will hopefully play a huge role in that. There's, you know, the technology exists now. It's, you know, the. the a Russian pilot can can speak in Russian, and, and a French air traffic controller can speak in French, and it, they both understand each other through technology. You know, so the, the Russian pilot is translated into French, and the French is translated back into Russian. And, and the technology for that exists already. It's just obviously safety is 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 a huge thing. I, I like to. Th I, I think there are parallels with self driving cars. You know, our initial reaction is, oh, I don't know about that. You know, we, out here in California, they've just introduced um, self-driving taxis. And wow. I, I haven't tried one. And, and, and I'm, to be honest, I'm a bit wary of it. I think, oh, bloody, oh God, you know. Well, the, the reality is, is that given time, these self-driving vehicles will be considerably safer than human-driven vehicles because they don't get tired, they've got perfect vision, they can mm. see all, they can sense all sorts of things that human can't, you know. So it's always a case of when is the right time to switch. It doesn't need to be 100% safe. Nothing is 100 risk-free completely. But if we can get to a situation where it's at least considerably better than the human situation that we have at the moment, then you'd have to say, you know, that that's the way to go. Um, it's, it's, so it's funny you say. It's funny you say yeah. that. I had a, but when I first came to Cologne, uh, not long, well, not long after arriving, one of the I had a friend who was part of a, uh, the development team for the new Ford Focus in Ford's European headquarters here in Cologne, and I remember when they made. He came to pick me up one Friday evening in Ford's first properly working self park Ford Focus, yeah. and we got where we were going, and he said watch this and you know put his hands off the wheel and the, the car parked itself at which point you know first time i'd ever seen anything like that outside you know a, a film or cgi or whatever and oh my god this was the most amazing and most scary thing i'd ever seen in my life but now here we are what 10 12 years later and and you know if you want to and dare i say um yeah 
I uh, we I have a member of my family, one, one of my daughters, whose uh, ability to park a car is uh, you know it's certainly much safer for her to use the self park features in her yeah. Kia than it is for her to try and do it herself in certain circumstances. So you reach that point that yeah, the technology outweighs. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, again, it needs to be handled carefully and, and certainly with, mm. with aviation. You know, you can't just switch this on tomorrow and say, good luck, guys, off you go. It's going to be a very slow process. But, you know, I, I think eventually AI and machines will do a far better job than humans can do, um, specifically on communication. And, you know, we're, we're not very, very good at predicting the future. Yeah, if you'd asked my parents about self-driving cars, if you'd asked my grandparents about this thing called the internet, where you know it was just completely beyond what their brains were able to conceptualize, and probably it will be the same in twenty-five years' time. I think you know there will be solutions that will be around in twenty-five years' time that you and I was, God, I never saw that coming. Yeah. Um, you know, it's changing all the time, but I think um, I think one of the challenges for for aviation, the industry as a whole, is what technology does it invest in? And I'm not clear in my mind how this works best. You just leave it up to the free market, and and the the best solution wins, or do you pick a solution and say, right, you know, over the next ten years, we're going to invest in this and 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 and, and get it to the state where we can implement it throughout the industry. In fact, it's interesting. We had, we had that yeah. discussion, we had a discussion today about, we we're talking about CPDLC challenges and yeah, yeah. there's so many different approaches to that. We've kind of ended up a little bit in that situation in some context there. So I think there's lots of good examples. Yeah, you, you can waste an awful lot of time and an awful lot of money and then find yourself back at square one. So, mm. you know, it's a big industry wide discussion. I'm not sure if it's happening. But, you know, clearly in, in terms of communication, you, you want standardization throughout the industry eventually. Um, what that standardization will look like in 20 years time, I, I, I have no idea, but I'm pretty confident that it will be very different to what it is now. I think that's what, in a sense, what makes the industry kind of exciting. It's, yeah. Uh, you, you don't know what's coming next. You can predict it. And there's the fun in predicting it. There's the fun in the conversations as to where it's going to go. And then, you know, hopefully enough of us will still be around long enough to go, well, I never thought that would happen. It, exactly. So, uh, but, but you know, at the end of the day, John, is, you know, just ordinary people like you and I who make this happen. Uh, somebody's yeah. got to, it's not going to just burst out of a bubble and be then you know there's there's going to be people working on these things and pushing these things and and hopefully um you know making it all a bit better and i guess yeah i always love that one of the things when we do these podcasts it's great just to expose a topic a bit more and the kind of things that you know kind of try and have the kind of conversations you'd had have over a coffee at a conference that kind of thing that you know yeah. not, the, not the real fancy technical stuff, but yeah, the nitty gritty of how things actually happen and the challenges people have. It's yeah, the, you know, it. the big picture stuff is always an interesting one to sort of imagine. But um, but I, I think one of the going back to sort of radio telephony as it currently stands, I think one of the problems um, with native speakers, especially, is. And it's coming from a good place. They're trying to help, but I don't think they are helping. Is is they become too verbose? They speak too much, and I think this is especially in in um, accidents or abnormal situations. You know, if you and I have a as we are both native English speakers, so if you and I misunderstand each other, I think the likelihood is we would become more colloquial. And I would say, no, oh, John, you know, you know what I mean. You know, remember? Yeah, yeah, and, I know. Yeah. And, and we would we would kind of root it in very colloquial, simple pub language, if you like. Yeah. And and I think that's the last thing that you want to do if it's a native speaker, non-native speaker situation um, in aviation where there's a potential problem. You don't start talking. Oh, just relax, John. When you, uh, it's simplicity is the key, and and. Of course, you've got to say stuff, but you've got to keep it as short and simple as possible 
And that is back to your your point about, you know, what is the purpose here? The purpose is to to get information from A to B so that it's understood in the way you wanted it to be understood. So, uh, you know, just sort of pointing out these sort of things to native speakers sometimes, you know, are, are you know, in, especially in an emergency situation, you know, the, the heart races and, and there's loads of research that shows that we speak, we speak faster yeah. when, when we're panicked or when we're under stress or even under workload, we speak faster. But I didn't realize until recently that there's also research, research which shows that we, we listen differently when uh, we're stressed. Everything seems faster. So, you know, again, it's an argument for slow down, you know, slow down your, your speed of delivery because the, 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 the person at the other end of the radio is, you know, um, and if you want to communicate effectively, you have to slow down. That's, I think that's a great piece of, yeah, it's, it's, great piece of advice and a great you know I, I love all the different topics we've covered there we've kind of come to coming towards the end of the time here but i think i i think it's a great that particularly that slow down is a great lesson and all the other little things that we've talked about you know using being clear of the purpose and looking at uh you know, thinking of the things you say and how you say it i mean i'd be interested maybe we do a follow-up specifically on speed of speech and tone and things like that because i know you know there are lots of facets to this yeah. that we barely even scratched I, I, the surface I, of already. I, you know, I, I agree. I, you know, I think, you know, it's easy to talk about the problems and, and it's it's less easy to talk about the solutions, you know, to say, oh, communication is rubbish and his, his, his or her English is rubbish or he mm. speaks too. That is easy to do all that good stuff. But the, the challenge becomes, well, how can we make it better? You know, what can we do? How can we communicate these points? How can we... You know, I said earlier, people don't like to be told that we immediately bristle if somebody says, oh, John, you need a, um, you know, but I think if you can explain why it's so important to stick to standard phraseology, um, if you can explain why it's important to, to speak at 100 words a minute, which is the IKEA recommended speed, why it's important to chunk your information into short short, sharp, mm. precise messages, et cetera, et cetera. Then I think if people understand that, they're more likely to do it. Um, yeah, that's good. good way of putting uh, it. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us on the podcast and thanks for all your My support pleasure, with the articles and things. And yeah, look forward to catching up with you on another session at some point soon. Okay. Thank you very right. much. Cheers. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.